Hi everyone, welcome back to Neurobiology at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorgis. Today we're going to talk about one of five papers that were published in the journal Cell in 1985 by Ron Vale and his colleagues that all centered around the discovery of the kinesin motor protein. The title of the paper is Organelle Bead and Microtubule Translocations Promoted by Soluble Factors from the Squid Giant Axon. It was written by Ron Vale, Bruce Schnapp, Tom Reese, and Mike Sheets. It turns out in 1985, I started as a scuba diver for the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where I currently have a year-round laboratory and where the experiments for this publication were performed. In my career, I ended up working with three of the four authors on this publication. I was a technician at Harvard Medical School with Bruce Schnapp. I collected surf clams for Ron Vale for downstream experiments on kinesin's role in cellular division. And I did all of the experiments for my PhD at Brown in Tom Reese's lab at the Marine Biological Laboratory. And I did my postdoc with Tom at the National Institutes of Health. All four of these authors are very close friends of mine, and Tom is among my very closest. The story of kinesin, in my mind, begins with an experiment done by a scientist named Bob Allen, who was at Dartmouth College, and I'm just going to draw a typical neuron, a nerve cell, with the nucleus, which contains the DNA, and the cell body, and the dendrites, of course, that connect to other upstream neurons. We have our axon, and in the squid, it's the giant axon, which is one millimeter in diameter or so. And then in the case of the squid, the giant axon innervates the muscle and connects to the muscle through the neuromuscular junction. Bob Allen was an inventor as well as a scientist, and he developed a type of microscopy that he named Vid Allen after himself, Video Enhanced Differential Interference Contrast Light Microscopy. So it's a mouthful, and I'm not going to talk about the DIC part of it, but it's a way of generating contrast so that you can see structures in tissues or in cell types, and he could use a 63x microscope objective and put a cover slip on the giant axon and put some oil that is needed for this type of lens, some oil in between the microscope objective, touching the glass of the objective and touching the glass of the microscope slide, or I'm sorry, the cover slip. And then the axon itself can be on a slide and that can be on the stage of the microscope. And we talked a little bit about microscopes in the laboratory demonstration. That there's a light source coming from down here. But what Bob Allen did, besides developing this DIC part, is he was one of the first people, or maybe actually the first, to put a video camera on a light microscope, which seems crazy now because we all have a video camera on our smartphone. and uh, But at the time, video was rather novel. It was a brand new technology. And if we have some eyepieces coming off of our microscope, you could view the sample with your eye through the eyepiece, or you could capture the image with the video camera and portray it onto a monitor like this. And it turns out that when he used this setup to look at the inside of the squid giant axon, he saw things that you couldn't see with your eye. Somehow the video camera increased the resolution of the light microscope about 10 times, and you could see things inside the cell with the video camera that were invisible while looking through the eyepiece. And what he could see is a, a the axons like this on the monitor. And he could see that there were these filaments inside the axon and that there were these little cars that were moving in both directions and the super system of trafficking. And he named this phenomena axonal transport. 
a x o n a l axonal transporter. And I know Ron showed some videos of axonal transport in his eye biology movies. I meant to draw some arrows in this direction too, so you could see these cars moving both down the axon in this direction on filaments and some moving in this direction on the filaments. So they happen in both directions, but they never saw the cars turn around and go backwards. So you wouldn't see one go down in this direction and turn around and come back. Many people who first saw these images wanted to understand how this phenomenon occurs and how these little cars move along these tracks. And one of those people was Ron Vale. One of the first experiments Ron and his colleagues did was to extrude the cytoplasm from the squid giant axon. So if we have our axon like this, and we just, this is our cell body, and this is the terminal end of the cell, if we just dissect out this part of the cell, the axon itself, the squid giant axon, like this, and you can tie this end off like a balloon with a piece of thread, and this side as well. But then if you cut this, so this is open, so you have kind of a, if you tie it off here like this in a knot, you have your axon, something like this. And this end is open, so there's just cytoplasm or the cytoplasm of the axon, they like to call the axoplasm. You can take a glass rod and you can press it down on the axon, like this, so that your glass rod is pressing down and squeezing these two cell membranes together, the top membrane, this part of the membrane, and this part of the membrane. You squeeze it down, and then you roll the glass rod forward, and that squeegees out the axoplasm like toothpaste out of a tube. And so Ron and his colleagues did this, and then they diluted it with some buffer, and they placed a little bit on a slide, a smear of this on the slide with the cover slip, and then looked at this using video-enhanced DIC light microscopy. And they could start to see more information in the monitor. They could see that there were single filaments like this, and they would cross sometimes, and these were the tracks, and they could watch these vesicles, which we now know are Golgi vesicles and mitochondria, and you could see them move along this filament, and oftentimes you could see them move in both directions, like this on the same exact track, and it would look like these two we're going to collide with one another, and somehow they would move around each other in continuing on their path. This one in this direction towards the end of the filament, and this one in this end. So there must be separate tracks on this filament that allows the cars to pass one another. And you could also see that these vesicles could jump from one track to another track. So a single filament could support bidirectional movement and the car could move from one track to the other. It turns out they also realized that the system needed the fuel, ATP. If you watch this for a long time, these cars would start to slow down and eventually stop. And then if you added ATP back into the system, they could start up again. And continue on their journey. They then looked at these filaments in an electron microscope and they realized that these filaments were microtubules. They then took their experiments a step further. We said that if you had an axon that you could squeegee out the axoplasm or the cytoplasm of the cell, the axoplasm of the axon, 
and you could add salt to this. So you have a, a test tube now, and they use potassium iodide, which is a very strong salt, and it breaks up bonds between, between the materials. And so you have broken up everything into its individual components, and it dissolves the microtubules into individual tubulin monomers and it breaks up the actin and other structures within the cell. And then they did a biochemical purification, which we've talked about before. I mean, they're trying to separate different components of the axoplasm. And they had three different concentrations of sucrose. Sucrose, it's a sucrose density gradient, which means that you're separating things based on their density, 15% and then 12%. And they layered this material on top, that is it floats here on the surface of the 12% sucrose. And then they spin this sample under very high centrifugation and things separate out. And it turns out that the cars, the vesicles, migrate into this 15% layer here. And it's very easy to remove these. You can see them. They look like milk, and they're very small. You can't see the individual vesicles, but you can see them as a group, as a, as a cloudy substance. And you can take a syringe, and you can poke the syringe, the needle, through the plastic test tube, and you can draw out these vesicles. It also turns out that there are still components left up here in what they call the supernatant. So we have the supernatant, S1, and we have the vesicle fraction down here, and they remove both of those components from the squid axoplasm. Okay, so let me redraw our sucrose density gradient that's been centrifuged. And remember, this is 45% sucrose made up in a buffer solution. This is 15%, this is 12%. And then we've spun it already, so we have the vesicles in the 15% fraction, like this. And then we have some soluble material in the supernatant. And you know, there might be some heavy stuff that made it down into the pellet here, and there could be things floating on the surface of the 15% layer and the 12%, but they were, and they tested all of these fractions, but they concentrated now on the S1 and the vesicle fraction, the supernatant and the vesicles, supernatant one. And it turns out that they did this really cool experiment, which is my favorite experiment of all time. They didn't know that whether the car ran along the road, so if we have a microtubule and we have a vesicle, the question is whether this the motor, whatever causes the movement of the vesicle, is it attached permanently to the vesicle and it walks along somehow the microtubule, or are there things attached to the microtubule like little hands that pass the ball along the microtubule? I mean, is the motor, is the thing that's generating the force and allowing this to move down in this direction, is it permanently attached to the vesicle and again, walking down the microtubule or is the motor permanently attached to the microtubule and passing this down like a, like a beach ball at a rock concert, you know, everyone pushing it with their hands type of thing. They didn't know that. They then went on to do these really cool experiments and this experiment called the microtubule gliding assay is my favorite experiment of all time. So they took a glass slide like this, 
and they wanted to know whether the S1 might contain some of the motor. I mean, they predicted that that's a possibility. And they placed some of the S1 onto the microscope slide like this, okay? And then they added some microtubules. And we talked about this before, but you can buy from a company or you can biochemically purify yourself tubulin from a tissue type like brain, for instance, because neurons have a lot of microtubules in them. And you can put the tubulin in a solution that promotes polymerization and they grow into microtubules. So they put a little droplet of the S1 here and they remove the excess. So there's just a little thin layer of S1 and then they add microtubules to this, like so. And then they add a buffer solution so that this thing is it's still in a liquid. And then they add a cover slip. And they put this under the video enhanced differential interference contrast light microscope and these microtubules started to glide around. They started to move. So the supernatant must contain a motor protein, some sort of motor, and it causes the microtubules to glide around. That was the first interesting thing. But they followed the movement and they, they had marked where they had placed the S1 so they knew where this droplet was and they reasoned that if the microtubule has the motor permanently attached like this or you know up here I could have drawn it up here like this then this microtubule should be able to walk along like a centipede anywhere it wants to go so it could it could walk you know, in this direction, and then it could walk out here away from where the S1 droplet was placed because the motor is attached to the microtubule, and so it has little feet, and it could walk all over if, indeed, the motor were permanently bound to the microtubule. But if the motor is permanently bound to the glass, I'm just going to make another one here so it's not quite as confusing. If the motor somehow is bound in this area where the S1 was placed, and so it is stuck to the surface of the glass, and it is passing the microtubule along like a beach ball at a rock concert. That is, the motor's bound. Let me see if I can draw it. So if you have, you know, two feet like this, with a motor, we know that kinesin now looks like this, I mean the motor, the motor protein kinesin, and it's bound to the piece of glass like this. This is glass down here, and it is, and the microtubule is like this. If this, these two feet move one over the other like two hands, it could push the microtubule around on the glass and the microtubule then could not possibly migrate out here. The microtubules would all have to stay within the region that was coated by the S1 material and that was their result. So that means that the motor must be permanently attached to the vesicle and intermittently attached to the microtubule, right? I mean, your legs are permanently attached to your body, but intermittently attached to the road. I mean, when your foot is on the road, it's attached to the road. Really cool. I mentioned earlier that the process requires fuel, that is, it needs ATP. And so, of course, in these experiments, they added ATP to the buffer so that the fuel was present for the microtubules to glide along the cover slit. They then wanted to test whether the S1 could support the movement of latex beads. So they took a microscope slide and they added microtubules to the slide which stick. If you add the microtubules to a dry slide, they stick permanently to the glass surface.
and then they incubated S1, the supernatant, with glass beads, I'm, I'm sorry, latex beads, so they have S1 and the latex beads, and some ATP, of course, they need ATP, and they add these latex beads to the microtubules, and indeed, the latex beads move along the microtubules, but they only move in one direction along the microtubules, and they calculated the rate of movement to be zero, 0.5 microns or micrometers, right, per second. Okay, so this is S1 plus beads, right? And of course, there's ATP. There's always ATP in these experiments because it needs it. Let's shade the beads black. The beads are black and they move along the microtubules and they only move in a single direction. Even though we know that if you extrude cytoplasm from the squid giant axon and you look at it by video enhanced DIC light microscopy, that single microtubules can support bidirectional movement. That is organelles or vesicles that move in both directions but they don't turn around. So some vesicles move towards the plus ends of microtubules and some vesicles move towards the minus ends of microtubules. Now, they wanted to test whether these vesicles could also move along the microtubules because these are the cars that they're observing in their inaxonal transport, just looking straight through the cell membrane or looking at extruded cytoplasm. So they do another experiment here where they have a slide and they again add some microtubules that stick to the surface of the slide and then they add the vesicles. See, so these are vesicles and ATP, of course, ATP, vesicles plus ATP and they put some buffer on it and a cover slip. And I'm going to draw the vesicles with a clear inside. And the vesicles now move along microtubules in a single direction. And these move at about 1.6 micrometers or microns per second. So that's interesting. I mean, the glass beads move at 0.5 microns per second, but the vesicles move at 1.6 microns per second, you know, about three times faster. They then wanna know whether the glass beads and the vesicles are moving in the same direction along microtubules. So they do another experiment where they have vesicles by vesicles and then they also have beads that have been saturated or bound you know soaked in s1 solution so we have vesicles beads plot that were incubated in s1 so sort of plus s1 plus atp and they put microtubules on the slide and they notice that the glass beads, which I'm gonna fill in the center on the glass beads, and vesicles both move in the same direction like this. But the glass beads move much slower than the vesicle, three times slower. Okay, let's review what we know. So we have the squid giant axon and it has, here's the axon here, and of course it has a cell body. There's the terminal end of the cell that innervates the muscle and connects to the muscle through the neuromuscular junction. We have a nucleus which contains our DNA. We have dendrites that connect to upstream neurons. 
And it turns out that if you just look through the membrane with video enhanced differential interference contrast light microscopy that you see on a monitor because the video camera increases the resolution tenfold so things that you can't see with your eye in the eyepiece show up on the TV monitor here and what they could see is that there were some filaments in there and the, the there were these cars and the cars could run in both directions along these filaments or or so it seemed and then if you dissect out an axon like this and you squeegee out the contents the axoplasm and you dilute it with some buffer and you look at that in the microscope I mean with the video camera on the TV monitor you could see individual microtubules well they figured out there were microtubules because they looked at these structures in an electron microscope and they could tell that indeed they were microtubules and they're around you know they're just scattered around because you've diluted this stuff and the microtubules lay on the glass cover slip and they could see that the cars could go in both directions on the microtubule without crashing into one another remarkably and the car could move from one microtubule onto another and the system required ATP. Then, if you biochemically purify the different components of the axoplasm and you spin it over a sucrose gradient, you can create a couple of different fractions, one of which contains the vesicles, the cars that is, and the supernatant, which contains soluble proteins and they called this, you know, S1 for supernatant 1. And then this is the vesicle fraction. And if you take the S1 and you put it on a slide, in a patch, and you add microtubules, the microtubules glide around in the presence of ATP, but only within the area of the S1, meaning that the motor, whatever it is, must be permanently bound to the glass and moving the microtubules around kind of like a beach ball at a rock concert. I mean, it's getting passed along kind of hand over hand along the surface. If the motor were permanently bound, bound to the microtubule, then it would be like a centipede and it can walk out here, but that never happened. So that was a big important part of the process. Then if you lay microtubules down and you add the S1 to latex beads. I kept saying glass beads, but they're latex beads. I'm sorry. And uh, you add those two together in the presence of ATP. They move in one direction at 0 0.5 micrometers per second. Second, if you add if you add the vesicles to microtubules, they move in one direction along microtubules, but at 1.6 microns per second. Okay? If you add both together, both the glass beads coated with S1, and you add vesicles, so this is the, sorry, again, latex bead, not glass, um, and this is a vesicle. They both move in the same direction, but the glass, the latex bead moves slower than the vesicle. Then they want to know, well, look, if these vesicles and these beads are moving only in one direction along the microtubule, which direction along the microtubule are they moving? Because we've said that microtubules have an orientation. Remember the Bass experiment? So there are many microtubules inside the axon, and in the axon they are all oriented such that the plus end 
is away from the cell body and the minus end is towards the cell body. So in other experiments outside of the, the paper that we have been talking about, they took centrosomes because we said that centrosomes are made up of microtubules and so this is half of the centrosome. Of course, there's another half over here. And we said that the region where the microtubules are held together is called a microtubule organization center. And we know, based on studies, that the more dynamic end, which is called the plus end, is here. And the negative end of the microtubule is here. And when they added either latex beads or vesicles, the glass bead, latex bead, and the vesicle both move, move towards the plus end of the microtubules, which means that the motor that they're looking at must be moving the cars in one direction down the axon, down the axon. Okay, now they want to biochemically try to purify the motor protein, whatever it is, and, you know, there's motor, obviously, there's a motor attached to the vesicles here in this fraction. And then there's the S1 up here. And both contain a motor because the vesicles move along microtubules and the S1 promotes both microtubule gliding and latex bead movement on microtubules. So this has motor in it, but there's all sorts of things in this fraction because it's all of the soluble proteins from the axoplasm. Well, they decided they really couldn't use squid giant axons because they're pretty hard to dissect and at the end of the day you don't have a lot of material. So they decide to use the brain of the squid or what's more correctly termed the squid optic lobe, the lobe of the brain that controls vision. And they're about the size of a pea. And there are two of them. So if you have the tentacles of the squid, you have an eye here like this. And the tentacles and something like this, two eyes. The optic lobes are pretty good size and they are right underneath the eye. Because the photoreceptors that detect light send axons through the back of the eye cup into the optic lobe, like this. So you can dissect these really easily and, um, and generate a large amount of material. I mean, you know, many grams of material. And they assume that if the motor is in the squid giant axon, that it would be found also in the axons located in the optic lobe. Now, there was another really, really important and awesome experiment that was done by another scientist, Scott Brady. And what Scott was able to show, that is if you take um, some of these cars and you add them to the microtubules, so here's, I'll draw a thick, fat microtubule, and you add the car, of course, with some ATP, they move. They move along the microtubule, and we now know they move towards the plus N. But Scott used a different uh, molecule, which is called AMP PNP, which is a non hydrolyzable analog of ATP, meaning that it binds to the pocket on the motor and stops ATP from binding. And since this is non-hydrolyzable, it can't, the motor can't use the AMP PNP to produce force. And what happens is it locks the motor, whatever it is, to the microtubule. So now the motor is permanently attached to the vesicle, but it's also permanently attached to the microtubule. And if you now add detergent, Detergent, we know, attacks lipids, and this is a lipid membrane. I mean, the vesicle, the surface of the vesicle is the same. It's lipid bilayer, and so if you add detergent, you dissolve the 
vesicle. And now you just have your motors, if you added a lot of these, so you had a lot of vesicles um, attached. Another one here, was, which was attached. And you dissolve away all of the membrane. Now you just have motors permanently attached to microtubules. So this was a very important finding because by knowing this, Ron and his colleagues could then purify the motor from the squid optic lobe tissue. So what do you do? Well, you, you grind up all biochemistry always starts with homogenization, which just means making a milkshake, essentially, in this case, an optic lobe milkshake. And so you have this material all ground up. And what they do is they spin this in a centrifuge and it creates two samples. It creates all this material that went into the pellet and then there's some buffer solution added when they grind, when they homogenize the tissue. Like I said, it's kind of like a milkshake. So you add some liquid to it and you grind the optic lobes up and this is a supernatant. I mean, you could call this S1 because, well, it's the first supernatant of the preparation. And this now contains soluble proteins. And if you test this to see whether it can promote latex bead movement along microtubules, it will. So they know that the motor is in this um, liquid from the optic lobe. So now you can take that sample out, that is the supernatant out, you take this part out and you add it to a new test tube and throw the pellet away. This would be P1, pellet one. And now you have a solution with soluble components in it, like this. Okay? And it has the motor in it because if you test the supernatant for its ability to push microtubules around in the microtubule gliding assay, or you add it to latex beads, they, the, the microtubules will glide and the beads will move along the microtubules. So it's in there. The other thing that's in there are tubulin monomers, the building blocks of microtubules. And now, if you add some chemicals that promote microtubule polymerization, you now have microtubules in your sample. I mean, you just took this and added some reagents that promote the polymerization of microtubules. That is, you get the tubulin monomers to build like Legos to form microtubules. And now that's what you have in this test tube. You have microtubules that are floating around. And if you now add AMP, P and P, to this solution, the motor, and if there are vesicles there, they bind, the motor binds, and so does the vesicle, like this. And now after you let the motor bind to the microtubule, if you add detergent, like this, then it causes the vesicles to dissolve, so you don't have this anymore, and all you have are motor proteins attached to microtubules, plus all of the other stuff that's in this test tube. But now, if you spin this at high speed, then the microtubules are now very heavy compared to the tubulin monomers, because the tub tubulin monomers are very, very tiny, and you know, when you polymerize microtubules, you have thousands or tens of thousands of tubulin monomers coming together to form the microtubules. So now the microtubule is really heavy compared to all of the other stuff that's in this solution. And now you've bound the motors to them, so they're even heavier. And you've dissolved the membrane, so you no longer have the cars. You don't no longer have the vesicles. And if you spin this now, the microtubules have the motor attached to it like this down at the bottom of the test tube and you have all the soluble stuff up here and you can throw this part out. 
right? And if you now save these microtubules and the motors attached like this, and you add a ton of ATP, lots and lots and lots of ATP. Now, the ATP can outcompete the AMP, PNP for the binding site for ATP, and the molecules now come apart. So you have now in individual motors like this, and you also have microtubules, but they're no longer attached to one another. They're all individual molecules. And now if you spin the sample under high speed, your microtubules, which are still big and heavy, come to the bottom. But now the individual motors that have been released from the microtubules are light again. And so they end up being in the supernatant. And through this technique, they biochemically purified a motor protein, the very first motor protein of this family that they named kinesin. Greek to move, kinesin. And they found the first member of the kinesin motor family, which is an extremely important group of proteins. They tested ultra-pure kinesin, and scientists looked at these molecules, I mean other groups, they looked at it in an electron microscope and they noticed that the structure looks like this, which I've drawn before, but they didn't know that it looked like this until they biochemically purified kinesin and looked at it by a technique called glycerol spray but it's a technique that allows you to just set the motors onto a slide. It's, it's called a grid for an electron microscope. So you have um, motors that are laying on the grid and then you can look at it in the electron microscope and it looks like this. And they ended up calling these heads. It would have been better if they called them feet because those two heads walk along the microtubule and they are bound ultimately to the vesicle. Now, one more point. When they take the purified kinesin and they add the purified kinesin to latex beads, and then they add the latex beads to the microtubule, the latex bead moves towards the plus end of microtubules, and it moves at 0 0.5 microns per second. So that's confusing because we've been saying all along that the purified vesicles move at 1.6 micrometers or microns per second and latex beads with either the S1 or latex beads with kinesin, purified kinesin, both move at 0 0.5 microns per second. So the team knew that this was a troubling aspect and they didn't know whether there were two different motors, one in the supernatant, which was the same as the purified kinesin, and there was a second motor attached to the vesicles that moved the vesicles along the microtubule, or maybe the motor was damaged somehow, the motor that's here, and the kinesin motor purified here, maybe they damaged it somehow through the biochemical purification process. So either theory um, could be true. Okay, everyone, well, there's more to the story, but I thought that these experiments were just fantastic and the whole story so intriguing that I decided at some point I would work on kinesin myself. That's it for today. See you guys next time.